Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We got a very special guest today, Adam Hadari. Please uh, introduce yourself and tell people who you are, what you do, a little bit of your background, so on. Absolutely. First off, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Adam Hadari. I'm a former law enforcement officer in South Carolina. Left law enforcement in 2020 uh, to help better the profession. Um, I run a page called Police Post on Instagram. Um, I also um, own and founded two companies, Effective Fitness Training and Effective Fitness Combatives. And there we seek to train above the standard for law enforcement officers. Uh, as you've seen in the past couple uh, couple years, particularly, uh, law enforcement's kind of been under attack politically um, as for some of their responses to certain situations. And so our job is to make sure they're getting the proper training in order to be more prepared for the job. And what is it, um, I, I guess if you were trying to diagnose the issue aside from the symptom itself, what, what, what are the, what would you say the root causes of the lack of training are? Well, you could always say budget. Budget is always one. Um, but I would also say it's lack of understanding and education from leadership and the ability to want to change. Um, change is, change is hard and it takes time and an effort as it pertains to like an agency, like a government entity, as you're probably very familiar with, mm. um, takes, takes time, effort to change that. And sometimes people are just frankly lazy. They don't want to do so. Um, so it's easier just to keep doing what you're doing than to actually affect change um, that is beneficial for the agency. So I would say leadership and budget probably are the two biggest role players in why things aren't changing as quickly as they could. Do you think there's a... Uh... <clears throat> I, I guess, let me see how to say this. Are, are there agencies out there that you're familiar with that are doing things the right way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Could you give me some examples it, of those and, and what they're doing sure. that other people aren't doing? Yeah. You know, there are a few examples, um, mostly in states like Florida, Texas, even South Carolina, um, where they have, I would say, probably more conservative states, uh, for lack of a better uh, way to put it. And that's just because of, of, I guess, their values and what they hold uh, important to them, right? So, you know, obviously, keeping criminals away and putting them away is plays a role in society, right? And so, um, I'll give an example of one agency. You have an agency like um, Orange County Sheriff's Office in Florida does a very good job of implementing good training, good leadership. Um, you know, obviously they have some leaders within that agency that probably aren't the best, but for the most part, the sheriff and things like that, the ones that actually can make decisions, um, hold their officers to a higher standard, which then allows them to have resources to, uh, to do the job effectively. Hmm. Do you know of any, uh, just in case there's any LE listening right now, do you know of any like... <clears throat> federal funding or any other kind of grants that are available to local police to, to reach out to companies like yours or Mike Glover or Tim Kennedy or somebody like that who provides, you know, ancillary training? Yeah, there are a lot of bids and um, free training too as, as well, but things like FLETC, mm -hmm. uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Centers, they offer a lot of free training for law enforcement. Would I say it's good? I would say it's probably better than what they're getting at their agency. Um, and usually FLETC does a good job of floating the bill. Um, you know, for room and board and things like that. Like your agency may need to pay you time off and, and uh, give you time off in order for you to go attend training. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of grants out there, especially if you're, you know, around a, a body of water or a border state, um, Mexico or Canada, usually Homeland, there there are a lot of grants out there, uh, especially canine grants, special operations grants. Like when I say special operations, I'm, I mean like canine and SWAT mm -hmm. and, and specialized units. Um, uh, yeah, so those are those super fine uh, niche uh, disciplines and units within law enforcement usually have a pretty good uh, fundraising or budget or uh, grant allotment. Uh, so why, why is it that this isn't being taken advantage of by a lot of places, you know? 
Yeah, that goes back to leadership and being lazy. Mm. Uh, you know, frankly, putting in for bids requires work mm. uh, and it requires follow up emails, stats, data of your agency, why you should get this grant over another agency, things like that. So legislation does play a role in that as well. Um, friends on the board and things like that, the old, the old uh, good old boy system mm -hmm. definitely plays a role in that as well. Um, and again, a lot of agencies don't have the education to actually know how to do these things. They don't even know of the websites or the, um, you know, the government agencies to even reach out to, to make that happen. Is there a, a, a list somewhere or some company that does awareness on this or how, how, yeah. like, how, how would the average, you know, deputy sheriff somewhere figure any of this out? Yeah, there's Google is is a really good resource. Um, there are a lot of five hundred ones that do donate that do donate to law enforcement uh, law enforcement agencies, particularly more like gear, like vest and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Not really so much training. Um, that's probably where you're going to get more into the the like the homeland type grants and things like that. Um, Google's a great resource. I know at my agency we had someone whose job their sole job was grants. Um, was to go out there. And so maybe dedicating a particular person to deep dive into that, into that world of grants and scholarships and all these other kinds of terms people are using for free money, basically. Um, go, go and just really, you know, absorb yourself with all that information so that you can then access that money and then put it to use. Um, I know a lot of these grants do require receipts of things that you buy. Like if it's a canine grant, they obviously want to see the canine or a cage for the vehicle or the training and the gear and things like that. So it's not just they give you money and they just cut you a check and you're, you can go buy it on sure, whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. There's always going to be some kind of compliance I would imagine. Um, of course. Involved there. Um, yeah. So it seems like there are more resources than, we would expect. I know the, I know the federal government through a DHS program has been giving military style vehicles and hardware to to uh, police all over the country. I don't think that's really appropriate, frankly. But um, you know, we had it and decided to fucking just give it to people because what else are we gonna do with it? Oh, I guess we left eighty billion worth in Afghanistan for the Taliban. But right, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how much. I agree with like local police having armored MRAPs and shit like that just for I, like, well, I'm not, I, I don't like the idea of the militarization of police. It doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Yeah. But, well, I, what are your thoughts on that as a former LA? Sure. Yourself? Sure. Yeah. So there is, uh, I believe what it's called is the 1033 program mm -hmm. where the military will then, uh, I guess, lend or lease uh, equipment to law enforcement, I know my first patrol rifle was uh, M16A2, um, old school with the uh, triangular foregrip. Yeah. yeah, it was from uh, from Vietnam, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, it was as I get what I can. You know, uh, we then upgraded to FNs with mm -hmm. optics and lights and all this fun stuff. As it pertains to the militarization of the police, I think that. There are two different, two different jobs, right? You have guys that are in the military doing their military stuff, especially like the combat arms. I was never in the, in the military, so I can't really uh, give a, a fair assessment of what goes on in the military. Obviously, I have a lot of friends in the military. My whole family served all that stuff. Um, so I have a good idea of kind of what goes on. So as it pertains to the gear and equipment, I would say that the missions are very different as it pertains to like what is the uh, – and goal for the most part, like hostage rescue is relatively the same rescue the hostage, uh, you know, but as it pertains to like things like the AMRAP and, and these like, and like these armored vehicles, I would say that they do provide a benefit, uh, for certain scenarios, right? When you go up to, um, like a barricaded suspect's house or things like that, and you have, um, someone in the yard or whatever the case may be, you can use that vehicle for cover. Cause obviously most, uh, regular vehicles aren't, ballistically rated for, well, anything mm -hmm. for the most part. So um, unless you're hiding behind the engine block. So really as it pertains to like certain gear, I think that NVGs do serve a purpose. I think that the technology within law enforcement is getting pretty uh, pretty advanced as it pertains to the use of drones, um, like being able to drive drones through houses to clear houses, um, even using like the robotic dogs to clear rooms and to go upstairs. 
um, or even to deploy things like gas um, into rooms like less lethal options um, are super important. So again, I would say that it really depends on the particular situation, but most agencies don't have a very big budget. So a lot of that stuff does come from the military um, because it is, it's either goes, well, either we use it or they sell it to somebody else mm -hmm. <laughs> really. Um, and so again, I would say it's very specific for the task at hand and the situation that it is. But I mean, things like obviously cops don't use grenades um, or any type of like rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, those things obviously really wouldn't serve a purpose, but like, as it pertains, like, ex you know, explosive breaching is something that's, uh, commonly practiced and sometimes even done within law enforcement mm -hmm. to breach doors and things like that. Um, so yeah. So again, I would say that the tools can be very similar, but I would say that the mission set is always probably going to be extremely different. Don't you think though, that militarization of the tools brings on some component of militarization of the attitude of the officers involved. Cause I do, I I've seen this like the, it, the attitude, you, you, I don't know if you've experienced this specifically or not. Um, <clears throat> and this is a more common thing, but the going from a patrol uniform to riot gear, for example, there's a noticeable change in the attitudes of the people there. And it look, that's understandable. It, sh it should be because it's a different kind of situation, but it does, uh, it is concerning to me when we give the state and agents of the state more power, right? That That is always of some concern to me. But I also, uh, we, we just talked about it on Drinking Bros the other day. One of the things that, one of the things that I think we don't speak too much about um, because I don't think anybody has a real solution for it is, is how difficult it is to go get into gunfight. Like if you're a SWAT person or any kind of special tactics unit of any kind, uh, and you're out, you know, getting into gunfights and stuff during the day and then going home to your wife and kids at night. That's not good. Like a, that, that's a very difficult thing to do. I know from my perspective, you know, doing that in war, <clears throat> the average person, it takes them months, if not years, to unwind from that kind of stuff. Not, you know, the 45 minutes it takes to drive home. You know what I mean? Right. I, from your perspective, I wonder how... If, if there's strategies that you used to, you know, use to handle that kind of situation or, or maybe there isn't, maybe that's just the price we pay. You know, it's that, that, that's an, or that, that is a possible answer. So yes, uh, to a lot of what you said, um, this job is not like any other job, right? It, it's, it's a, it's a very different occupation where you don't go to normal things. Um, and what I mean by normal things People only call you because they want you to solve a, solve their problem or solve a problem, right? And those problems can range from a kid that's drowning in a bathtub or a kid that got stabbed by one of his parents or a sibling or a shooting or a medical emergency, whatever the case may be. Um, so being able to, to actually decompress from those situations, there are very little – now, there again – there are about between 17 and 19,000 law enforcement agencies within this country, right? So I give that kind of brief gap because I'm not sure on the exact number, um, but it's somewhere within that and about 700 to a million law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. um, so some agencies do a better job of allowing their officers uh, to have access to resources to help decompress and to help understand that what they see uh, may affect them later on and that um, the ability to to become insensitive to to certain things can also happen, right? Um, and again, everybody has their own own thing. Some guys can handle it very well. Some guys can't. Some uh, and and it just goes on a on a case by case basis. But I think what's becoming a little more popular is uh, asking for help. Is asking for if you realize that that you are you know. Your fuse has gotten shorter. Uh, maybe you're at home life. Maybe you started drinking a little bit more than you should. Uh, maybe you're, you know, maybe you can't sleep. Maybe your recovery is off. Maybe you stopped working out. You know, just just these very common unhealthy habits um, and bring attention to those, and then really seeking help. But it is be, it is becoming more and more accepted to go get help. Um, however, there is uh, there is the other side to that, where sometimes if you ask for help and your agency finds out, they can 
say you were unfit for duty, um, which I think is complete and utter bullshit. Mm. Uh, personally, um, as someone who has, who, who has talked to somebody, um, and it, it's, it's just something that, that needs to be accepted without, um, criticism and without, you know, affecting their ability to, to be able to do the job they want to do and also provide for their family. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's this, we've had discussions <clears throat> about the special operations community as well, where, you know, to be effective, it, it's not a lot of, there, there aren't a lot of people that can do that job Correct. Um, right out of the gate and to be effective, you know, you have to, you have to be a hundred percent in and sometimes there's a, there's a price to pay for being 100% in on something like that. And usually that price is paid by your family, frankly. Um, Agreed. And, you know, the, the question is, how do you mitigate some of that stuff? And I'm not sure what the answer is. I'm not sure that if you include the, the high stress of combat, the time away, the traumatic brain injury, I don't know that there's a way to reasonably deal with that. I think... And look, it's not, I don't want to have a defeatist attitude about it, but I think it might just be that we have to fucking eat it. You know what I mean? There's nothing we can really do about that. Yeah. I think there are things we can do to help mitigate some of those issues. Like why are we working 12 hour shifts? We should probably be working eight hour shifts, Mm. you know, obviously based on what we know about the human body and and how the, and really how the body kind of decomposes after a certain amount of hours, like how, how our reaction time is slower, Mm. um, and things like that night shift, obviously, uh, sucks fucking Mm -hmm. it's it's literally the worst thing you can do for your body um increases stress cortisol disease increased risk of cancer and just the list just goes on and on and on and obviously like you know you can't work an eight to five and be (laughs) and be in law enforcement um and i went to costa rica one time and actually there are some agencies in america where they are so short staffed where it's like if anything after 7 p.m call 911 we'll get somebody out to you as soon as we can yeah yeah. Um, you know it is what it is but One thing that can help mitigate some of that stress is also higher level training and being prepared for certain situations, not being surprised by certain situations whenever you, whenever you get there and having those, um, Oh fuck, what do I do now? Moments. Um, those moments, you know, obviously increase level of stress Mm -hmm. and, and can then, you know, cause, cause long-term effects afterwards because it, was a traumatic event and everybody has their own definition of what a traumatic event is. But obviously if you train at a high level, uh, how you perceive that stress may not be as high as it would be if you, if you, you know, weren't trained at all. Sure. Right. So, you know, so obviously being prepared for what the job entails obviously will help mitigate some of that stress. Um, again, just like you said, sometimes there are things you just got to eat it. Um, I think that, until there's a way for, I don't think it'll ever happen. To be honest, I don't. Yeah, I, can't I think mean, it it's difficult. Right you would need forty percent. You you would need to be about forty percent overstaffed, I think, to be able to rotate people in and out the way that it would be appropriate to do so. And when I say appropriate, I mean if somebody's involved in the gunfight thing is not that as big a deal, in my opinion. But uh, close proximity to loud noise and explosions and shit like that, and toxic exposures are big things. They fuck your brain up real fast. And and it, oh, yeah. and it in turn fucks up, you know, your ability to handle stress. It fucks up your hormones. There's all sorts of things that happens downstream of that. And it can be dealt with, but, you know, you got to fucking relax for three to six months. You know what I mean? Right. Like you have to go to a brain clinic and let them do the things they do to people's brains to make it uh, work again. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's feasible to do that. I mean, from budget wise and then finding the amount of qualified candidates to do it in the first place seems like it would be a pretty steep uphill climb and you mentioned um the degradation of all sorts of of uh, of uh, uh things in the human body after a certain amount of time um after 19 hours the human brain operates as if it, it is uh at 0.08 be, uh, blood alcohol content, right? So that means Correct. after being awake for 19 consecutive hours, your brain operates as, uh, in, in a way that we have all collectively decided you shouldn't be driving a car, right? So right. I'm not sure standing behind a gun is a good idea for that either, frankly. Right, and then from another perspective, society demands absolute perfection, mm-hmm. right? And so um, that's also another stressor there. So being absolutely perfect and now we're having cops getting 
probably more hurt now than they have in the past um, because they're more hesitant to do things, right? They're more hesitant to use necessary and reasonable force mm -hmm. because they don't want to make the news. They don't want to be, you know, so that's, so that's, so that's also another stress in the back of their head is, is maybe I don't want to pull a trigger cause I don't want to be, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want my life to be over, but if I don't pull a trigger, maybe my life's gonna be over anyways. So that stress also is, and then of course you have your agency stress of fucking brass breathing down your back. Um, also demanding absolute perfection, um, while you're being worked into the ground during that, you know, 12 hour shift mm -hmm. plus sometimes, fortunately, depending on the call out. So, yeah, it's wild. And, you know, we're starting to see just, <clears throat> you know, I, I've always maintained and I, this is true for, uh, military folk and first responders. I think the job is difficult. Nobody questions that it takes a lot out of you, but it's doable. It, it, and I think you need a couple of things. One, you need the support of your leadership obviously is a big, big deal. Like knowing people have your back. And I think the appreciation as, as maybe petty as it sounds, the, the appreciation of the people you're serving is really important. You know, when, um, when you feel like you're, what you're doing is noble and just and, and the people you're doing it for appreciate it. That's one of the things, particularly for men that really matter to us is, you know, that, we're exercising our biological imperative to provide and protect. And uh, that is being appreciated and respected by those under our protection is a big deal. And, and that's pretty much gone, right? Like in a, you, you said it before in a lot of smaller jurisdictions uh, and in conservative areas, that's still the case. But for the most part in big cities, it's just not anymore. We live in Austin and things are uh, deteriorating rapidly here. Um, and it's a function of that attitude, I think. So right now, there are, um, <clears throat> as of February this year, there's 264 vacancies in the Austin Police Department. And 77 additional people are retiring this month. And 77 more next month, or 70 or so more next month. Uh, basically means uh, Austin carries about 1,600 officers. They have about 1,600 billets. So that means about 22% uh, of their billets are unfilled. So That's you're, yeah, that, so you're working with 78% force instead of what you would want is 110%, right? So you can rotate people in and out. They're at 78% now and it's, it's getting worse. People are mass retiring. They're moving to other jurisdictions and things like that. Look, I don't blame them. I wouldn't stay here either, frankly, but you know, this is, this is what, what I, I think it's societal decay, right? It's 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 the inverse of broken window theory. When you treat things like shit, they go away. Correct, correct. And I mean, you said it best. Uh, when you see somebody get burned by a hot stove, you learn really quickly that you shouldn't touch the hot stove. And so, it it it's simply come down to leadership. And I usually don't get into politics. I'm not a big political guy. I'm a I'm I'm a realist. Uh, that's honestly. That that's ever a party that's the party i would probably be in um but the political climate greatly affects law enforcement and even law enforcement training which is then has to be addressed right um luckily i worked in an area which was which was pretty pro law enforcement um we're we're uh, i mean i live in south carolina big 2a state here um you know no issues but again i've been to austin um and i've I've talked to cops in Austin and a lot of them are, are just, I'm, I'm from here. I stay here. I, I work here. I have friends who just came down from York. They were for NYPD. They hate it. They hate working there. They, they hate, they, they can't even do their job because they're so restricted by political figures. They can't even use force properly. They can't even arrest someone the way that someone should be arrested. Um, simply because of, of bullshit. Mm. basically and just lack of education and intelligence and 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 experience and i suppose um you can only take so much of that right i mean you, you one of oh, two yeah, one, one of two things happens you either leave for greener pastures or a better situation or you just start phoning it in right not taking yeah. risks not getting out of your car that's a big problem now right cops don't want to get out of their car anymore and yeah it, it why would, i guess it would be easy to criticize them but it's like I, when people ask me, even about joining the military, uh, I'm like, no, I wouldn't join the military right now if I were you. 
Well, to, to go do what for whom exactly? You know what I mean? Like we're not doing Correct. the right thing uh, and internationally right now. The United States isn't. So why would you do that? I, my, my advice to people, frankly, is to go to a sheriff's department in, a, in an area that likes law and order and work for them. Right. Because one, it's an elected position that's your boss and not some, you know, uh, uh, city police chief. No, no offense, but most of those guys are kind of I mean, that's a political position. And it's a political, it's a political position where your boss are second and third party, uh, um, elected officials who are just trying to get reelected as sheriff, you get reelected based on whether or not you prevent crime. You know what I mean? It's that, that is your entire job as it should be. It's not about, um, it's not about demographics or any of that other bullshit. It's just about, can you get this job done? Cause that's ultimately what people will vote on if you're a sheriff. I think that's Correct. pretty good advice. But I wonder if, from your perspective, guys that are getting into law enforcement, especially if you live around a big city, do you have any advice for people like that? Because we get that question a lot. Yeah, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to start your career, start in a place where you can actually be a police officer and a place that actually likes cops. Um, why? I mean, why would you go work in a place that does not want you there, does not like you, and doesn't even allow you to do your job? Um, that's... Besides all that, it becomes it, uh, it becomes a huge officer safety risk, right? Because obviously, because obviously, they always tell you that officer safety is is really number one, right? Like when you go into a situation, when you whenever you pull a traffic stop, you approach it based off of your safety, mm. right? I mean, obviously, you take into you take into consideration, you do everything right there to make sure that they're in a safe place. But obviously, you walking up to the car, you don't know who's in the car. Why, you know. They could just be speeding because they have to take a poop. Mm. They could be speeding because it just killed somebody. You have no fucking clue, right? So, you know, why why set yourself up for, I don't even want to say failure, but why would you say just, just to be in a bad place um, where you can go somewhere that accepts cops, that maybe has an opportunity for advancements, better pay, better opportunity, better family life, um, and understands that. And there are agencies out there. There's actually a lot of agencies out there like that. Um, even some in, in some of the less conservative states, um, you know, obviously communities are small. Um, and so maybe they really like cops in that really small community. Well, then go work there, mm. right? Maybe they pay you good. Maybe they, uh, maybe they take care of you. Maybe they have good training. Maybe you have good leadership. Good leadership is everything. And one phrase that I, I actually commonly say is the biggest threat to law enforcement is law enforcement itself. Not even necessarily the bad people. It's, 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 the lack of the lack of leadership and the lack of initiative and people ask well what's why isn't change happening well just like we hold officers accountable for their actions on the street um we should hold their leadership accountable for the actions of those officers because sometimes it's caused by the lack of training that you did not provide mm. and i promise you once you start to attack leadership in the sense of holding them accountable you'll see a change you'll see a change because it's it's well i mean the officer did it he, he, you know, we, we didn't train him that way. Well, how did you train him? I mean, it's, he's your officer. Well, he's only been to one firearms class this year because that's, what's mandatory. So you did not provide him enough training. So you're expecting him to go out on his own and do it. So yes, he should go and train on his own. Like you should always want to train to be better every day, really. Um, but the agency should hold some kind of liability there. And so I think until we start to see brass being held accountable for the for the actions of their officer um you know it it's going to keep just going in a, a continuous circle so it might be a good idea then to <clears throat> if you're uh looking to get in policing or if you've been in for a while and you're you're uh moving to a new area or whatever the fuck um <laughs> you know maybe it's a good idea to when you go in for your interview to interview your leadership as well 100 like, percent, and, and get a vibe man like yeah. you, i mean like what what kind of like you what, know what people. kind of questions would you ask like if you if it was your sergeant and your captain and you're interviewing for a new city police job what would you what kind yeah. of questions would you ask them so usually most guys going in are, are very young mm. right they're they have very little life experience uh i was 23 when i became a police officer um which is which is extremely i mean i know guys in the military 17 18 years old going in um and doing those things so obviously like life experience up to that point i would say between the ages of 17 and uh 
22, 24 are very limited, right? So, so the ability to even probably read people isn't even that good, right? Like you're not going to be, you're not going to be good to be able to read people. I mean, of course you have your exceptions, right? If it were me, um, I wouldn't even ask leadership. I would probably go around and ask guys on the street, go ask the patrol guys, go ask the sergeants, go ask the guys that have been there for 15, 20 years, go ask the guys that have been there for two years. How are you feeling? How are you liking this? Um, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Are you leaving? <laughs> You know, um, and if so, why or why have you stayed for 15 years? And, you know, and you might get a plethora of, you know, responses, but your, your job is to decipher and see which one is is, you know, good for you and the best for you and your family. Mm -hmm. Always, always take your family into consideration. And I think people sometimes because the job can become your identity, just like in the military. Um, and and that's that's not that's not. That's not a healthy uh, mechanism. Sure, yeah. I mean, you definitely want a little separation of church and state there. Uh, it, For sure. It, it may be... I, sometimes you could find this publicly, um, but I would look at retention rates. That's always a pretty good indicator of whether or not you're on you're dealing with a, a an organization that's good. You know what I mean? Um, high, turnover, I agree. high turnover rates in law enforcement in a specific agency, that's a really bad sign. What we call a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cool. Well, that's good background on policing and stuff like that. I appreciate your uh, your input on all that stuff because I know a lot of people wonder about it. Tell us about Police Post and what it is, what you do there. Yeah. So um, Police Post has been around, been doing it for about a decade now. Um, I started it when I first started uh, becoming a police officer. A buddy and I were running it, um, and I started every time I would make a mistake, like a pretty dumb like walking in front of a vehicle where the guy's passed out at a, at a green light and walking in front of a vehicle trying to, you know, bash in his window, mm. um, you know, don't do that. So I was like, let me just go ahead and post this on, on Instagram. I started doing that and started gaining a lot more traction. And then from there, I started posting training points, which I thought were very helpful. Very Sometimes they're very obvious training points, but they're things most people don't think about. Um, so what we do is we break down body cam footage, uh, situations, training, and help just to provide a resource and to make cops mentally aware of certain things. Because obviously, staring at your phone, you're not getting much training in. But those mental reps mm. may then, you know, get integrated into your training, which will hopefully make you a better police officer. Um, and then off of Police Post, um, that's where I developed uh, the two other companies that I am currently running now. Um, but with that being said, I am not the only one I am. I'm the guy that kind of started it, but I have uh, 28 other people within the, uh, within the organizations. So, uh, it's a team of cops, military guys. Um, and you know, we have to have like our admin our IT people and things mm -hmm. like that to kind of get things going. So yeah, we've been doing it for about a decade. Um, and, and, you know, increasing the standard of policing has always been the objective. Yeah, I think it, it's a good idea. One, one, the comments section, the crowdsourcing, right, and having, you know, so it gets a little wild sometimes, but having a decent yes. debate between people who have a lot of experience is not the worst thing you can do, right? I mean, Agreed. Uh, and then there's a lot of people who are visual or kinesthetic learners who aren't going to understand a situation until they're either in it or they see somebody else in it. You know what I mean? Like literally see them in it, not not a simulation or uh, reading it from a textbook you know what i mean and i think Correct. to be honest amongst the type of people who get involved in policing that's probably a plurality if not a majority of people that need to learn that way hands-on or 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 some kind of visual expression so yeah uh, it's i think it's a really good thing you guys do and it's always you know at, at least it's entertaining if you don't if you, least, if you don't have at any, least the comment section is yeah, always entertaining. if you don't yes. have any practical use for it it's still pretty goddamn entertaining <laughs> um, all right, let's get Thank into you. the let's get into the citizen stuff here. So the the, sure, the, do it. the general idea of this show is that um, you can either bitch and moan about your you know your rights and what you're entitled to and all this shit, and you can clamor for the state to reserve and, and protect those rights for you, and you will be a subject of the state because they will decide how, when, and why to allow you those rights, which aren't rights at all. Those are privileges, by the way. Or you can secure them for yourself, and then you'll be a citizen of a country. Um, and we have this list of principles that we like to 
use to kind of frame this ideology and it's it's a working list you know it's, I, I i edit things from time to time if somebody says something that makes a lot of sense to me but we'll start with the first one you picked i'll support and defend liberty against all enemies foreign and domestic i like the the bifurcation the uh in, in this one support and defend right so sword and shield and then sure. foreign and domestic and it what, what that tells you is that you're not you're not loyal to the institution of government itself you are loyal to the principles behind it right the idea that ma that makes america what it is not any individual leader not any individual uh, uh agency or any of that shit. it's it's about the principle so um, tell me your thoughts on that and kind of how you might apply that in the police world. Sure. First and foremost, I've been called everything under the sun, bootlicker, and the list goes on. Simply because I'm, I was a cop. That's it. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'm an American. I was born here. Um, my parents, uh, well, my dad's an immigrant, but he's a, he's a, he came here legally uh, when he was 18. My mom was born here. Um, and I think cops sometimes will get a get kind of bunched together, um, especially especially when this whole COVID thing happened. Um, and I think it really really made people kind of realize uh, the importance of of those rights um, and the protection that 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 as a law enforcement officer's job, your job is to uphold the Constitution, um, and that does include the First and Second Amendment for sure, hundred um, percent. And so with that being said, I, I think that the ideal law enforcement officer's job is to, just like you said, is, is kind of that sword and shield is to protect uh, what it means to be an American, right? So the Constitution, um, the, the general uh, wellness of all people, right? And the ability to provide that protection. Um, so with that being said, I think, I think, I think that is what law enforcement is. I, I think that whenever, whenever I saw it, I was like, well, that's why I became a cop is to, is to help protect this country and the people within it mm. and allow them to be free and allow them to be unharmed by, by the evil that does exist uh, in this country. Um, Cause there are bad people in this country that do, that want to do bad things to good people for sometimes no apparent reason. Mm. Um, and that's and that's unfortunate, but that's why I think law enforcement exists. It's a very necessary profession. I think that it does exactly that, at least at least in my mind, and at least my approach to law enforcement and the people that I surround myself with. That is what we believe in. How do you, as a as a patrol officer, say no to an unlawful order? You know, because I, I, I guess the question, like, how do you balance your oath? Sure with the expectation of leadership that's often led by politics and not principles. You know what I mean? Agreed. Yes. So great question. Uh, you say no. And it's, it is really that simple. Um, there may be consequences to follow. Um, and there obviously have been um, a few instances where, where law enforcement officers have been fired for not following orders uh, and things like that. Now, I don't know the, the details of, of each case. I, I have heard about a few where there were some other underlying things there. Now that may have been motivation to just go ahead and get them out of there. Sure. Um, but most of the time law enforcement officers aren't, aren't usually just like getting fired for saying, no, they don't want to do something. Right. Um, I, I don't, I personally do not know a police officer that has enforced a mask mandate or has taken somebody's guns. I do not know. I, and I know a lot of cops. Uh, I know guys, local state, federal level, um, not one. Now I'm known to take cops off of bad people, like cops, guns off of bad people, mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, you know, violent <laughs> felons and things like that. But, um, you know, I, it's pretty easy to say no discretion is there for a reason. Um, and that is one thing that was slowly being taken away from law enforcement kind of, or not taken away, but slowly being pushed um, hey, you guys need to enforce these things. Well, is is it a law? Is it a policy? And and if it is a law, like, 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 like for example, like, like the whole mask. I never wore a mask. Like, mm -hmm. I never, I never did that. Um, you know, um, unless I was taking my kid to the doctor's office and they and, and they asked, I'm not trying to fight with the doctor, or whatever. Yeah, just yeah. you know, my kids are sick or whatever. Sure. Different story there. Um, and I'm also in a medical setting, so mm -hmm. it's kind of a little bit different there. But for the most part, like grocery stores and shit, dude. Like, cops weren't wearing them here. Like, I. I I didn't really leave much, you know, I, I, I keep my circle small for the most part. Um, but 
saying no and understanding that you have that discretion to say no and stand up for what is right. Because that is, again, that goes back to your first point of that is that is what I think law enforcement is about is, is to allow, is to secure those freedoms for people and that nobody's going to infringe on those freedoms. It's there. Aside from just generally, general speaking, uh, public safety, which is obviously important for a, a variety of reasons. I mean, it's a big part of economics, you know what I mean? Cause people, for sure. people invest more in their local area if they feel like they have some sense of ownership in it and they have a broader sense of ownership in something when things are going well and things are safe. This is just my, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Played out on a, on a community level. It's how it works. But aside from that, sitting at the, uh, at the intersection of potential authoritarianism and the general public, I think. I think it's why the, the elected sheriff in America is one of the most important political positions, if not the most in, uh, important political position that exists at this point in, in right. history. Um, but even at the city police level, because the thing about authoritarianism is it requires collaborators. Because typically speaking, authoritarianism comes from a very few and it's exercised against the many, like the, the mob, the group, the community, whatever. And it can only happen if there are people amongst the many, amongst the mob, amongst the group who are willing to do uh, what, what I consider to be evil on behalf of the state or the, the authoritarian. And I'm not sure we empower police enough with that idea specifically. Like your job isn't to protect the state from the people. It's not to protect the city or the mayor from the people. It is to protect the goddamn people from every, from everything. Right. I mean, that's, that's the job. So, you know, I wonder uh, when you went through, uh, certainly they don't talk about that in post. Right. I mean, that's not, that doesn't, that probably doesn't come up, but like, Policing theory, how, mu- how much of that is, is drilled into the head of a young patrol officer? Because that might be the person that it most applies to, frankly. Yeah, I would say none. Um, I would say, again, I can't speak for all, every and all academies. Um, I can only speak for the one that I attended, which was 12 weeks long. And I learned basically nothing. Arrest, um, arrest w- powers and shit like that. But I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you learn your laws, you go to the mm-hmm. range, you shoot some bullets, you learn how to drive, you learn how to, you know, stop correctly and make sharp turns. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you learn, I learned DT that doesn't fucking work, um, at all. Um, hence why I started a company. DT, you mean at, defensive tactics. You mean shit from the 1950s yes. that are, they're still trying to, yeah, the fucking, like they do like the brachial stun and like pressure point shit behind the ear yeah. and the, uh, compliance, I've never seen the compliant, it actually compliance nerve. Yeah. I heard about that. I'm yeah, like, yeah, nah, yeah. that's not a thing. What are you talking about? Yeah. I, I've, I've never seen it work. Uh, I've never really utilized it. Uh, now they're slowly getting away from it, but still the fact that it took fucking years to do that is, 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 uh, is very frustrating. But again, the young patrol officer mind is is very it's a sponge it's like a child mm-hmm. right they start to pick up on on things and the difference is you every cop's going to find their own way of policing they're going to find their own what they're good at what they like doing um and things like that but i think the the fto which is the field training mm-hmm. officer um is probably one of the most important roles in law enforcement hands down you are getting a baby and that and then your job is to make sure this baby understands how to do the job correctly i'm under the impression and i've had multiple people agree with me on this that it takes a from when you get cut off of fto it takes about two years for the i would probably say the the average cop to get a a pretty solid grasp on what it's like to be a law enforcement officer two years. I think we can increase that curve with better quality training, not necessarily time, but better quality training um, and exposure. But the FTO plays a, a, a very important role of shaping that cop's mind of how to approach the job for the next 20 plus years. Right. Um, and, and I think that again, I, I, I think, cause I, I don't know, I think that if we focused on getting better FTOs with better training for them, you're going to see a better law enforcement. You're going to see a better outcome, a better output mm-hmm. of these younger cops. Because again, these cops are 21, 22, 23 years old, right? So they they are super impressionable, and they and they just see things and they do things. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so again, teaching them the right way. Again, 
kind of incorporating just you're talking about like the policing theory and and how to be a good cop um should be the goal um for most agents sure yeah it most academies. not only are they impressionable which is certainly true because you know if they didn't know before they got into the job, once they're in it, they understand how fucked it is. Right. So they're looking <laughs> that just like anybody else, whether it's a young athlete or a fucking uh, private in the, in the military, they're looking for somebody to show them and not tell them what to do typically. Right. Just like a six year old um, a mentor. basically, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I feel like they, I remember being a young uh, soldier. And one of the things that I wanted to do, one of the things that, that really helped me was understanding the overall objective, right? Because a, a lot of times things are compartmentalized, especially in the military, probably more so in the military than in policing. But uh, I wonder if you ask the average, let's say 25 year old cop who's been on the job for two years, like what, what's your job? To explain your job to me exactly not not what you do from nine to five but tell me what the purpose of your job is and i feel like most of them would probably say to reduce crime or to do this or to do that but i'm not sure how many would say my job is to protect the people in my community right and i think uh yeah. i think that would be a really interesting conversation to have if we couldn't maybe have a forum with you know a couple of thousand young police officers and ask them to explain specifically what their job is and then what I'll do, Dan, is I'll I'll actually pose that question on police post. Okay. Yeah, I would uh, I would love to see the results of that because because I would be because I because I'm actually also very curious as well yeah. of the responses. I think you're going to get a uh, a wide variety of responses. Uh, responses. I think again, when I was 23 years old, and I was fucking gung ho, man. Mm. Like just like just like just like anybody would be, right? Like you go to the academy, shoot guns, drive cars fast. Like it's it's. It's fun, right? Yeah. It's it's fun in the academy because there's no there's no like perceivable threats sure, yeah. that are actually there. But that's also when, when you're highly out, when you're highly motivated like that, that generally corresponds with being a high level performer as well on the job, which is the mo- probably like you you know eight the eighty twenty rule. You're going to get eighty percent of your output from twenty percent of your people. That's always going to be the case. But if if that subset of the most highly proficient and uh, high, highly proficient officers think that their job is to make arrests, you know what I mean, then we're starting off on kind of the wrong foot, right? Like your job is not to arrest bad guys. Your job, technically speaking, is to make the community safer. Now, that might include arresting bad guys. Right. And it, it might include mentoring a fucking 12-year-old who's in a shitty situation too, you know what I mean, where you're like, hey, dude, put yeah. that fucking – throw it. you throw his weed into the gutter and you're like, look, asshole. Like at least fucking be smarter about what you're doing. Jesus yeah, and Christ. See, and let me tell you something about throwing out things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the body cams, uh, that, although that's done very, away with discretion, right? Body cams. It's very, kind of fucked. Yeah. It makes it very hard to do what you just said. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll probably leave it at that. Like it, it makes it hard to do, to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cause again, your job is not to fuck up some teenager's, college dream scholarship anything anything like that that is not that is not what you're supposed to do i i worked in the community that i was raised in so where, i knew where, I knew where a did lot you grow up I'm, I'm from greenville actually. charleston south carolina okay. charleston south carolina yeah so so relatively popular city in south mm-hmm. carolina um and you know i know a lot of people here i was a police officer here right so so i came across my brother who is seven years younger came across his friends underage drinking mm-hmm all the fucking time on the boat on the whatever the case may be like you you give them a lesson you keep them safe you know and if you're going to use you know if you're going to arrest somebody like make it have it mean something sure right like that's that's like that's you know that's kind of how i was was like one i don't want to do bullshit paperwork fuck paperwork that shit sucks right like it'll turn that 12 hour shift into a 15 hour shift real fast no shit like so some cops like oh my god like i just oh my god i drove past this cop and i was going 20 over he didn't even pull me over yeah because he's probably trying to go the fuck home (laughs) like he's probably trying to go home to his wife and kids right so you know cops are people too and i i keep trying to tell people that like you know oh cops need this you know well cops are people from society they're 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 not made in a fucking farm they're not made in a lab they're they're just normal people that sometimes 
sometimes take shape of someone who's who should not be a police officer. Sure, yeah. um, and that's unfortunate. It is, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's why I'm so keen on the understanding the underlying principles of policing in general, right? Because if you ask someone as a young cop, like, what's your job? And they say, my job is to get bad guys out the street. My job is to make arrests. My job is to do this. It's like, okay, that can come. So if you're out there looking for people to arrest, then everybody starts to look like someone you might want to arrest. You know what I mean? And look, exactly. b- being being a vigilant and being aware and having good situational awareness is a very good thing in any profession, no matter what you're doing. But um, if if we can reduce that to the actual purpose of policing, which is to say my job is to make my community safer. So any action I take should be in support of that principle is arresting a 12 year old who's smoking weed or a fucking 19 year old who's drinking beer in the fucking parking lot somewhere. Did I make my community safer? The answer might be yes, it could be right. But if it's not, you shouldn't take that action, right? That's why we develop mission statements, even in business, like our, our job, when we developed our mission statement at uh, black rifle, when I was the VP of marketing there, the mission statement we developed was we prove we provide con- uh, coffee and content and culture to people who love America. That was our mission statement. So if whatever action we were going to take didn't fit into that, we didn't take that action. And that's kind of, it, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's true North for you, right? That's your guide stone. That's how you operate that. I, so I'll be super curious to see how that, that goes on police posts. I really want to see that and see what the, yeah. the results of that are. I would definitely ask that question. Cause I'm also, curious myself um because again i think we're going to get a wide variety of similar it's going to sound weird like of similar category answers sure yeah arrest bad guys you know whatever the case where i mean and there's people that just want to wear the fucking uniform they don't Mm -hmm. they're just they're it's fucking halloween for them um and that's unfortunate that's true i I, uh you know again the whole tiktok cops and all this other bullshit that nothing makes me nothing infuriates me more than seeing somebody dancing on fucking duty. Um, it's just, uh, that's kind of a whole different ball game. And, you know, to kind of circle back really quick, if you don't mind, mm-hmm. um, you know, the relationship between law enforcement and the public is huge. Cause you'll see some videos of Joe blow off the street, helping a police officer make an arrest, right. Um, of someone maybe that was shoplifting or, or, or whatever the case may be, you know, one thing that I, I always tell people is, is and at least the cops that I know, I encourage people to carry. I mm-hmm. encourage people to, to, to uh, be prepared because cops may not be there the second you need them, right? The average response time is minutes, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes, like, sometimes in, the, in the double digits in some areas, right? So, you know, being able to respond and, and being supportive of law enforcement, there's multiple videos, countless videos that I've posted where, uh, you know, the general public has hopped in to help a law enforcement officer who's either struggling to make an arrest or whatever the case may be. Now, as a law enforcement officer, I'm like, we try not to use the public's help simply because of liability mm-hmm. and God forbid something were to happen to them. Um, you know, you should be capable to handle situation uh, yourself for the most part. Um, you know, obviously there's those crazy fucking, like with a fucking airplane crash in the street, you might need help or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should have happened in California, but mm-hmm. you know, uh, but that, but that relationship is really important because the general public has saved police officers lives in the past. And I, I'm sure it's going to continue to happen sure, all in the yeah. future. Um, so that's why you should be nice and be respectful and understand that the public, um, just like you said, we are there for the public. So. Yeah. I mean, if you consider yourself a member of the public, which I, I think that's a big problem. So there's a, there's an old quote from this show called Battlestar Galactica. I don't know if you're not a nerd, you probably won't know what it is. I know the show. I don't, I don't know much about the show, but I haven't heard. Yeah. Battlestar Galactica. Um, so there was just conflict going on where they ended up having to use Marines as police. And uh, the commander says, there's a reason you separate military and police. One fights the enemies of the state. The other serves and protects the people. 
when the military becomes both the enemies of the state tend to become the people, right? And I think it's that's why I ask questions like that, because I want young police officers to understand that their role is not to protect the institution of the city they're in or the mayor or the city council or the state or the federal government. Their job is to protect the people, even if it means protecting them from the mayor or the state or the federal government, right? That That's your fucking job. So Correct. I think it's a... It's a good conversation to have for young kids, uh, and it and it especially it, it kind of refocuses the way you think about what your job is. You know what I mean? It's like uh, what what we were just talking about: seeing yourself as an us versus them situation. You don't want to find yourself in that situation as a police officer. That's you. Your leadership yep. has failed you if you're in that position. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, if you if you think that way. Um, so the next. It kind of goes into the next principle. I'll do something every day to help my country. My countrymen are all men. <clears throat> this is one I like to focus on specifically because it kind of puts your brain in a bolo to find people to help. You know what I mean? Whether it's picking up some garbage off the street or holding the door for somebody, it doesn't have to be major shit. But, you know, you put yourself in a position where I'm going to help somebody today. I'm going to do something to help somebody today. And the aggregate of that effort with a, with a plurality or majority of people doing that problems that we have start to go away right and the people uh who prey on those problems whether it be criminals or the state who tries to uh you know use authoritarianism to stop those problems both of those people go away as well and we live more free lives collectively that's why i like this principle yeah it again reason why i thought that was again there were three that really stood out um that's kind of why I, I kind of do what I do. Um, and that, that was kind of my mission behind it was to be able to provide something because I know that law enforcement is not going anywhere. Mm. Uh, it's a very, just like you said, it's a necessity of this country. It, it, it does keep law and order, which is very important in this country and to be able to provide something to make them better, which will then a turn of, you know, affect society in a positive manner. Mm. Um, again, leave my, print before I go. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, and that's kind of what I do. Like we are, I'm a mission driven person and I run mission driven companies. Right. And the mission's always first. Um, and that's just like you said, you just said mission statement. And I was like, that's exactly what we drive. Those in our core, our core values are some that's what we hire and fire on. Mm -hmm. That's what we, um, that's, that is everything in this company. So that is kind of why, you know, me as a person taking that into business and now using that to help better the community and then obviously continue to give back, um, you know, obviously, because once you build something, you should be able to give back regardless. And we do that as well through multiple venues and uh, multiple avenues as well. So, you know, that's, that's some, that's, that's it is, is, change the culture. And that's kind of a, a phrase in law enforcement that's kind of being used as like, we're here to change a culture because the culture is it's, it's fucked for mm -hmm. the most part um, with poor leadership and poor training. And the job is to change that. That is, that is our mission. If you change that, you will see a drastic change in law enforcement, which in turns will affect uh, how society views law enforcement. Now that may take years and it's going to take years because it takes, you know, something like George Floyd to basically just all cops are bad again, mm. right? It just takes one, one incident like that. Now all cops are bad. They're all racist and what it, whatever label you want to put on it, which the like a rational human being knows that that's not true. Right. So, so again, to kind of go back to your point is, is, you know, the job is the mission and that is to change the culture. Yeah, monoliths, generally speaking, uh, that is to say, applying a single adjective to an entire group of people, right? Uh, like all cops are bad or whatever, uh, typically are defeated by personal relationships. Uh, there's an old adage, it's hard to hate up close, right? Um, sure. It's the reason that marriage equality is now the law of the land and nobody really cares about it anymore because sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s, people started just openly admitting they were gay and they're like, oh, my cousin's gay. Cool. Uh, I don't care. I don't care about that. No one fucking cares Sweet. about this stupid shit anymore. Um, but yeah, you're not gonna hate your somebody you grew up with just because they have some kind of fucking harmless divergent fucking trait. It doesn't make any sense. So this is where community policing comes in for me. When when you talk about changing police culture, that's what it means to me. It means that the 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 
men and women inside of your community, your jurisdiction, wherever it happens to be, your patrol area, um, know your first name, then they don't they don't think all cops are shit anymore. You know what I mean? And look, it's Correct. It's, yeah. it's not easy to do that. It's it's a fucking short shift. It's a big community sometimes. You know, it's a big, yeah. but uh, and, you know and, that's that's the thing. It's like these. It isn't just about additional training and it isn't even just about mindset it's about having town halls where actual patrol officers come to it in that area and be like hey i'm the guy that fucking walks this beat um i'm the i'm the fucking to for this area these are my fucking guys if you got a problem with any of them you come see me that kind of thing goes a long way it does it does and and to the communication um that thing right there sitting to your right right next to your mm. laptop that cell phone right there mm is is the social skill deteriorator of yeah. the century um when i was uh when i was training cops because i was a i was uh before i left i was a training sergeant and one of my jobs was to was to obviously run scenarios with uh new guys and girls and communication talking to fucking people like a normal person is is becoming increasingly difficult for some people and and uh but i can give them a cell phone and they can fucking emoji their way through a conversation yeah. right but they but they can't they can't just level with people and maybe that's due because they're young they don't have that life experience or maybe it was because they've lived the life with a cell phone in their fucking hand and they don't actually call people anymore they can't make eye contact um they don't shake hands they don't they don't really do these things anymore and that that goes a long way um my dad's old school. My whole family's old school. So that's kind of how I was raised, right? So communication and talking to people and not at people is a skill in itself, um, which 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 I think is a huge, also a huge de-escalation tool as well. So that's something where a lot of people need um, need to need to understand that that the change in the culture is also due to the age of the officers and, and their ability to to communicate or lack of the ability sure, yeah. to communicate yeah it's a good point um it's a really Fucking good cell point. phones man yeah yeah they're <laughs> i mean it's it's just the blessing and the curse looking somebody in the eye and telling them the truth has become increasingly difficult for people and in high stress high risk situations euphemisms and half truths they just don't work it's like oh. hey ma'am I understand you got a problem. I need you to stand the fuck over here for five minutes and I'll get to you. You know what I mean? You got to be able to look somebody in the eye and say that authoritatively Correct. in a way that they know that you're in charge of the situation. You know what I mean? Because confidence inspires confidence. That's how it works. Agreed. Agreed. Um, look, I appreciate your time today. It's been a really good conversation and I'm also looking forward to that, uh, that post, uh, tell everybody yeah, I'll post this week. Yeah. Tell everybody, uh, what you've got going on and then tell them where they can find you. Sure. Um, you guys can check out, Obviously, police post. It's just police post on Instagram. You can check out EF Combatives. That's where we host um, in-person classes, and we have online training, not only for law enforcement officers, but for the everyday person. We do a lot of concealed carry stuff, weapons-based entanglements, UTM training, and things like that. Um, again, if if the class says public, which most of them are, anybody, as long as you kind of clear through the background uh, process, can attend. Um, effective fitness training. We have fitness training, physical therapist, nutrition training, again, not only for law enforcement, for those that, you know, who want to be prepared and mm. get ready for any situation that they may encounter. Um, other than that, you guys can check us on Instagram. The websites are, are attached to the, uh, to the Instagram account there. So Dan, I appreciate you having me on my man. And I will, uh, I will post that, um, post that, uh, survey this week and I'll be, uh, and I'll send you the, uh, send you the, any answers yeah well i'll look through them i like to okay I, I, i'm a, i'm kind of a lurker like if i, I okay, get i go to, i go down rabbit holes on posts sometimes just because we are the same there's a lot of weird shit and it's just sometimes super funny to be honest yeah. well i'll uh, make sure because i am i am shadow banned as fuck right now oh, um yeah. so i will uh yeah I've, I've had five reported posts just this uh just this week so far so um i was just able to go live and then now i'm not able to go live anymore so um, they do realize that you're just posting information, right? They do realize that I'm also taking stuff from like media sources that are, have the same fucking shit. Um, but I guess, cause I have the word police attached to my name. I guess that just makes me a little bit different. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, but, um, yeah, brother, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming today. And thank you all for uh, watching and listening. This has been citizen.